You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Matt Nagaki, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while sharing killer craft beers. If you've ever wanted to sneak backstage and share a beer with one of your favorite musicians, well, Vox and Hops is the podcast for you. This week on the podcast, I dropped a killer episode with Johannes Ekström of Avatar. There is this episode and over 440 other ones to help you enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. So what are you waiting for? It's time to become a Vox and Hops head. Cheers! Today's episode of the Tone Mob Podcast is brought to you by Third Power Amps. Third Power Amps are handmade one at a time in Nashville, Tennessee. Jamie and the guys pay a crazy amount of attention to detail on these things, so you guys will not be disappointed. I've been playing the Wooly Coats Extra Try Me for the last couple weeks, and that is by far my favorite AC voiced amp that I've played. It sounds incredible clean, just straight in, doing the chords, doing the, uh, you know, the old U2 impression. The reverb unit in it sounds really, really nice. Um, But what I was most surprised about was the two buffered effects loop. I really like that effects loop. It sounds great. It takes all the time-based effects that you thought you loved and makes them even better. For example, I like the Red Panda Context a lot. I really like that pedal. This thing made that pedal up a couple notches, somehow. I don't know how it happened, but it's magic, and I suggest you check it out. All right, everybody, welcome back to today's episode of the ToneMob.com podcast, the show about guitar tone and the people behind it. I'm your host, Blake Wyland, and with me today I have Mr. Jacob Adams, a man who uh, actually has a hand in many things that you are not even aware of, but you probably own. So, how's it going, man? It's going pretty good. How are you doing? I'm, uh, I'm doing good. It's uh, it's not raining, and I just ate a bunch of carne asada, and nice. I, you know, I'm feeling it. Everything's good. Everything's it's, nice. It's it's not raining here either, but we just got our uh, first classic November cold front, and uh, it's it's brutally cold and windy outside already. Yes, it uh, it uh. It's kind of getting to that chilly point here, but I know it's not anything like what it is down there in Oklahoma. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, a lot of people, without realizing it, have, uh, you know, have uh, actually owned things that you and your crew down there at Mammoth um, have a heavy hand in, but they may not realize uh, exactly that you're involved, even if they've heard of your company before. So maybe give a, a high-level overview of kind of what goes on there at Mammoth, and then we can dig into more about you. Yeah, the the day-to-day operation at, at Mammoth is, it's not overly complex. Um, really what we do uh, uh, every day is CNC... Uh, aluminum enclosures. We do powder coating on on enclosures, uh, screen printing, both both manual screen printing and uh, direct to substrate printers or uh, digital printing, as as a lot of people refer to it. But um, most of, I say most, a lot of the a lot of the guitar effects out there in the world, in in some way, shape, or form were drilled, powdered, or, or printed right here in Oklahoma, right here at Mammoth Electronics. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, like, a, a, beyond just the enclosures themselves, you guys also sell the guts um, and all the, basically anything you need to put together a pedal. So That's, that's, that's very true. Um, the, the goal behind Mammoth Electronics... Uh, from the beginning was was really to be a, a one stop shop for for anyone in in the DIY guitar effects industry. Um, you know, or I would say around two thousand eleven, two thousand twelve, 
really building building your own your own pedal or or clone was was really kind of at its height at that time and it's it's still really really strong today and and mammoth's goal then uh was to be able to provide everything that someone would need to build you know whatever whatever analog effect you could think of and and over time mammoth grew uh at the same time foresight electronics which which is what i was part of was continuing to grow and and i dealt mainly with with all of the manufacturers that 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 you know um and and you know all of the end users know and it got to a point where really uh a merge just needed to happen between between Mammoth and and Foresight, and we decided to to go with the with the Mammoth name because Mammoth had I think at the time somewhere around thirty thousand customers, whereas Foresight had about a thousand customers. <clears throat> uh, even though Foresight was the larger company, uh, it was just a deal with where you know we were faced with the decision do we contact 30,000 individuals and tell them, Hey, we're, we're moving all of your accounts over to a new website. Right. Or do we contact a thousand manufacturers and just tell them, Hey, we're going to move you over. It's, it's not going to be too bad. And that's, that's the route we, we took. Mm-hmm. And the, the foresight side, which I mean, it's now one and the same, but at the time that was handling more of the larger contracts and things like that. Exactly. Yeah. You're, your your classic boutique effects pedal company that's all all of that business was was going through foresight whereas um if if you were if you were you know just wanting to build your own say tube screamer clone or you know reverb based off a of belt and brick what have you um that you would go to mammoth for for stuff like that gotcha gotcha so and and mammoth mammoth at the time uh and and still to this day on on parts it didn't have any minimums whereas whereas foresight had had pretty pretty steep minimums uh so that's that was really the difference between the two gotcha gotcha so was the machining the enclosures and everything like that the the basically the whole manufacturing process a completed enclosure was that always part of the puzzle or did it start more with like the part supply and kind of just head that direction because it seems like it, that's a big leap to make. It it is a big leap, and and technically, yes, it it did start on the part supply. Um, but in all honesty, like it's it's easier to tell the whole story if if we just start from the beginning. All right. And 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 that's that's starting in my Keeley days because, in a way, that's. That's kind of what led to uh, the expansion of of foresight and and eventually mammoth. Right, so, right. if you if you want to if you want to go down that road, we can go down. I, that I do, road. and I wanted to bring up something um, a little bit of a a little bit of a side note um, about you and your Keeley days before you or I ever met or talked or anything. Um, Robert actually mentioned you on my podcast when he was on last year about a little bit of an awkward situation revolving around your first day. <laughs> Maybe you can expand yes. on that a little bit. The The first day, um, well, re- really, before I even get to mm-hmm. that, I, I graduated high school in, in 2001. And uh, had a scholarship to 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 go out to Colorado and and to go to college out there, and I had a girlfriend at the time and figured you know what I'm going to stay here in Oklahoma because that was obviously the smart thing to do. Um, so I I started attending a, a small technical college in in Oklahoma City, and uh, my first day of my first day of classes. I met my professor who honestly I thought was, you know, Fisher Stevens from the from the short circuit movies. <laughs> um and yeah. <laughs> nice and reference. This this guy was 
was absolutely insane out of his mind. Like I, I didn't, I didn't understand. I didn't understand him. Um, and after an entire semester with him and, uh, finally getting down to our final projects for my final project, I built a clone of, uh, Ibanez sonic distortion that the SD nine and my professor, my professor, uh, after, after seeing my final project and, and hearing it approached me and asked me, you know, why, why am I wasting my, my time and money at this, at this school? Why not go to a real college and while attending a real college, come and work for him? Well, my professor was Robert Keeley <laughs> and, and it was actually his first semester of teaching. So he was, he was new to, to, to that whole thing. But, um, this was in 2001, so he had already kind of started his own company. Um, he had the Keeley compressor. They were building them on, on Radio Shack boards. Um, and he had just, he had just started doing the, uh, the Boss BD2 uh, Fat Mods and the Ibanez TS9 Mod Plus Mods. Well, I, I took him up on his offer. I was like, all right. I'll, I'll just move on from this tech school. I'll come, I'll come and work for you and I will go to a real college. So first day of first day of work, I arrive at his house pretty early, knock on his door. No one answers. It's like, Hmm, you know, this is weird. So I, I sit, I sit down on his, on his doorstep and I'm waiting and about 10 minutes goes by and I'm like, oh, I'll knock again. I knock, still no one. So I sit back down, just thinking like, well, you know, I'll give it ten more minutes and then and then I'm out of here. Well, right about the ten minute point, the second ten minutes, so twenty minutes waiting at his door, he opens the door in his boxers. Just like, who are you? <laughs> like, uh, the guy you asked to come and work for you. He's like, oh, hold on, let me get dressed. Uh, then he closes the door, puts clothes on, comes back out and, and the rest is history. <laughs> so, so yeah, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around, uh, maybe I'm a little bit weird, uh, or maybe he was a little bit out of it. I don't know. Um, when I hear a knock at the door and it might be, I might be in a compromised situation such as he was, um, my first instinct is to try to find some pants. Uh, I'm just throwing it out there. I, I mean, I, you would I think, think that so. is most people's initial instinct is at least pants, you know, bare minimum. Um, I'm just fascinated by the fact he was like, well, good enough. Here, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, like, I thought it was incredibly odd for for probably that first month. And then after getting to know him, that's just kind of that's that's the man <laughs> that's that's who he was <laughs> so that's awesome so yeah well let's take us take it from there because it's been quite a journey i'm sure we could uh there's a lot of i'm sure there's many many keely stories that you could tell yeah i mean there's there's a ton and and honestly at some point uh, this probably warrants a, a whole another <laughs> podcast where it's me and him and probably a whole host of others. Um, there's a lot of stories I won't get into. They're incredibly hilarious, but they're probably uh, better told right, on right. another day. Um, but, uh, but no, that's, that's where we started. So I started uh, for the first, first couple of months. I worked at his uh, kitchen table. Uh, right next to the kitchen table was a drill press that that I would use to to drill the holes in the in the BD2 and in the DS ones. Um, him and his his wife at the time would build uh, the two knob Keeley compressors at their coffee table in the living room, and uh, and yeah, it was it was crazy. We would we would just at the end of the day take everything that we had finished slap shipping labels on them, throw, throw all of it into the back of his truck and then race down to the, the post office, uh, and try, try to beat, beat their cutoff to, to get things out. And, 
those really those first couple of months and and the first couple of years were were just like that it was it was always a deal where it seemed like we were always you know two months behind or three months behind and no matter how much we worked and and put a dent into the backlog we we remained at at, at that two to three months point but <clears throat> we would we would hit the post office and and on occasion we would get there at the same time as the uh oh what band is it oh my brain's not working <laughs> oh uh the flaming lips got it also would use nice. the same post office as us so it was always it was always kind of cool to to run into those guys in that post office but uh but no, in 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 the first year, uh, I was able to get my uh, my brother in law Isaac Nelson, who also works here at uh, at Mammoth with me. Um, I got him on board at at Keeley, and uh, and really from there it was just it was a whole sequence of we would all get friends friends hired, and then friends of friends, and Robert would get his friends hired. I mean, they were his friends. He it was his business. He could <laughs> right. do what he wanted to, obviously. And, and I mean, the, the work environment was, was incredibly unique. Um, eventually we moved out of the, the duplex and the, the kitchen table that we were working at, uh, moved into a double wide trailer, uh, up in Edmond and me and Isaac and, uh, his cousin occupied a bedroom in this, in this double wide trailer. I would I would get enclosures uh from our driller at the time and uh I had a, a, a just kind of a, a silk screen system that was put together bet- from plywood and two by fours and, and screens we would get at the local screen shop and I would hand screen all of the pedals on top of the toilet in their little oh, wow. five by five bathroom. Wow, that's nuts. Yeah, no, it was it was insane. Like the the fumes would be so bad that you would just be struggling not to pass out. Um, but no, and and we we did that for a couple of years, and then we finally hit it big. And and Robert uh, Robert bought a Kojak shed, Ooh, which was like a oh yeah, <laughs> which was like a, a <laughs> ten by twelve like outbuilding that you would use to like store lawn mowers or, or stuff like that. Well, we turned right. it into a workshop. Four of us worked out there and, uh, in the winter time, Robert would go out, go out there first thing in the morning and, and turn on the little space heaters. And at eight o'clock we would show up and it, we would be warm from about the waist up almost borderline sweating. And from the waist down, you were a, a complete popsicle. <laughs> Um, during the summer, uh, we would just open up the two doors on the shed and, and just work with, with all of the, the outside wildlife just right there. Um, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and then, and then really, really we, from, from that point on, we, we, we did get in with FMI fenders, fenders distribution. Um, and and the orders the orders completely got out of hand i mean we this was at the point that we had i think crossed over a, a million in sales per year and we we're, we're getting we were getting up there closer to that 3 million point and it's hard to run a a 3 million dollar business out of a a double wide trailer and a kojak shed yeah that's tough so so we actually we we got a a respectable building and uh, eventually grew to the point where we had uh, thirty employees, and oh, wow. and and times were good. And uh, then you know when when times get good, you know things things can happen, uh, whether for for good or bad things things can happen. And. You know, I don't. I don't know if I don't know if Robert had had mentioned any of the stuff that he had gone through on on your previous podcast. Yes, yes, he did. He he, yeah, he brought up his uh, prescription painkiller addiction. Yeah, it, and like right right at the kind of the peak with with Keeley, uh, unfortunately that that had started to 
become more and more of an issue. And it was it was really at that time that that I had to make a decision and that and that was, you know, do I do I continue to work here full time and then, you know, after hours do do the schooling and 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 work on my engineering degree or or do I put the engineering degree on a just put it on pause and and start just you know putting all of my time and effort and energy into Keeley and and I, and I made that decision it was just from that point on it was going to be all Keeley and that's all I was going to do and you know there would be 50 60 70 hour weeks if not more and uh he made me the the vice president of the operation and and that's what I did and you know there would be unfortunately there would be times where he would be out you know for a couple of weeks or you know even a month at at a time and you know here I am just just a young kid and it's it's a it's a deal where like all right there's there's livelihoods here there's there's employees that I have to look out for and make sure that you know cells are there and and that we're supporting all of these people and it, and also at that time uh I had my first first child and and life was life was real life was serious so uh right. in my early right. 20s I had to become an adult in in a hurry and I I looked I looked back on it at at the time it was it was incredibly scary but I wouldn't have I wouldn't change it for the world because I wouldn't I wouldn't know what I know now or be in the position that I am now if if I hadn't gone through all of that. Right, it was almost like a crash course uh that I mean kind of rapidly prepared you for basically where you're at now and you know the other things that are coming down the pipe for you. It was a, yeah, no, it, something that it, most people your age probably wouldn't be ready to do. Probably not, especially in with with today's younger generation. Sometimes I wonder, but These but no, um, it 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 was a crash course in in life and in management and like personnel management, business management, um, and really with with electronics as well. Um, you know, one of like prior to that, uh, it was always funny. Anytime me or Isaac would run into an issue with a circuit, um, and we would be troubleshooting, troubleshooting that Robert would come in there and and help us out and, and point us in the right direction enough to where we could figure it out. And if for some reason we were having a hard time and had to ask him again for help, he would tell us, you know what? just just f and figure it out you guys just need to figure it out which at at the time i'm sure me and isaac were both were both offended right but honestly i that's how i learned electronics robert robert was right you know if if you're not going to school for it the only way you're going to figure it out is to just sit there and work on it until you figure it out is it one of those things so it's a little, and it's, a, it's kind of a strange question, but like I've I've talked about it before, usually in more of a, a musical sense, in that when you have a problem or a wall that you're hitting, is the best course of action sometimes to leave it alone and come back to it with a fresh set of eyes or ears? Is it with, the same without thing a with doubt. electronics? Uh, you know, one of one of the most is. This is terrible, but but one of the most common and frustrating issues that that I would see Isaac or or even myself or or one of the other techs run into, uh, they would plug in the pedal, nothing would power on, and they would go through the entire circuit and troubleshoot and try to figure out where power was failing, and finally they'd get frustrated to the point where they would just leave, or. You know, if it, if it was Isaac working on it and he just, you know, had been on it for two hours and couldn't figure it out, he, he would ask me to, you know, come in there, come in here and take a look at this. And I would do, I would, I would do that. And the first thing I would do was, you know, put a new battery in, on there, just plug a new battery in and lo and behold, the pedal would work. Oh, 
literally yeah. we would run into that problem like it, was, it would just be a dead battery I, and that's obviously in the grand scheme of of troubleshooting that's a that's a simple issue to fix and and we we would run into more difficult issues uh bad transistors bad ICs things like that but yeah without a doubt uh if if you're a person that enjoys coffee and you hit that wall you know get up get a fresh cup of coffee walk around call your friend you know talk to someone not about the pedal just cl- absolutely clear your mind of of whatever is going wrong um if you smoke cigarettes then go do that go have a cigarette and then come back to it and a lot of times just just that little brief brain reset uh will help you like realize what the what the issue is in the end right right yeah it's a you're not the you're not the first guy who's like kind of uh made that suggestion i've asked that question before and i'm kind of waiting for somebody to tell me no i'm wrong but uh that hasn't happened yet so that's interesting i I mean that's sometimes that's just that's just the best thing to do Right, right so Anyways, um, yes. in addition to the advice of, you know, just figure it out, uh, one of one of the things Robert would do, uh, periodically, we would round up all of the employees, and then he would, you know, grab a schematic for the, the compressor or the fuzz head or Java Boost, and he would step through there with a highlighter, you know, on the schematic showing us where the actual signal path is. And I I think for me, like once, once I was, was able to figure out, you know, what is, what is there for biasing? You know, what is, what is the actual signal path? Then, then things started to click. Um, And also at at that time I had picked up, picked a, a little bit back up with, with, with school most specifically, um, I completed all of my math uh, and just didn't do, I didn't complete any of the other subjects that I needed to complete. Um, but but the math being being obviously one of the more important pieces, that and, that and programming, which is more relevant today than it was back then. Um, but yeah, like... But between that, that's that's kind of what what set me on on a path to to be able to to do the design work. Um, but where where Mammoth and Foresight comes in to the equation, uh, I think it was probably around two thousand and seven. Uh, I was approached by some random guy from this company, Foresight, down in Norman, Oklahoma. And they had these these stomp switches that that they were saying were were really good. And at the time, I think we used uh, the new sensor stomp switches, and then whatever other stomp switches we could find on on eBay for cheap. And since they were local and their pricing was good, I was like, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll give you guys a shot. And and we started using their switches, and I was like, well, you know, really, they're they're not that bad. Um, I think a couple of the other switch manufacturers at the time were having issues with, with their epoxy and with, uh, with the washers. And I mean, you name it, you would, you would see almost any kind of issue with, with parts. Um, and then, uh, one evening they contacted me and said, Hey, you know, we would, we would really like to cater more to the guitar effects industry. Could you help us? It's like, yeah, I, I think I can. What, what do you need? And they wanted me to give them an entire list of all of the parts that a pedal company would buy. And I'm thinking to myself, this is going to take forever. Um, right. Cause there's and hundreds. Of parts. I, I mean, like it, it was like, well, do you want every single value that, that people are going to use? What do you want? And, it just came down to like you know basically in terms of resistors what what do people use for capacitors what do they use and, and I I put together a pretty hefty Excel spreadsheet and just sent it to them saying hey if you carry the bulk of this you've got most of it covered 
you'll learn from from other manufacturers what the other pieces are that you need. And they took it and ran with it and eventually, you know, became uh, the companies that, that they were before I started. Um, if we fast forward all the way to uh, 2011, um, Robert's, uh, Robert's addiction with, with painkillers got to a point where I was just faced with the decision, you know, do, do I stick it out here longer dis- despite, you know, my, my best efforts or, you know, do I, do I think about my family and, and their livelihood and, and take a different job? And it, it was at this point that, that some of, some of our best employees had, had just left. Um, Isaac, once again, my brother-in-law had, had actually left bef- before I did. Um, Nathaniel did, Medlin. Did they, leave, uh, did they leave because of the issues that Rob was having? Yeah. Or was it a combination of things? It, it, it was it, purely, purely the issues that, that Robert was having. Uh, really, no one had any ill will towards Robert at all. It was just, it was a deal where he was just never there. And, and when he would show up, he still wasn't there. Right. So, right. and, and a lot of us just felt like he wasn't taking us seriously. So, um, so then people started, started to jump ship, so to speak. Um, Nathaniel Medlam, you'll you know him from, from a lot of the Walrus Audio, uh, demo yep. videos. He, he typically goes out to the, the winter NAM with those guys. Um, he was one of my employees at Keeley. Um, it, that, that was one of the ones that affected me the most whenever, whenever he left. Um, Barry Dixon, who is now a builder for Category 5 Amps, um, he had left, uh, Brady Smith, uh, I had hired him on at, at Keeley, eventually he left and, and started Walrus Audio, um, he left right before I did, uh, Heather Brown, uh, had left Keeley and went to work for Electro Harmonics for a couple of years, and, I think since she's left there and she's doing her own thing now, but, but there was just, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of guys and girls who, who had big ambitions and dreams and, and we knew what Keeley could potentially become. But at the time, the thing standing in the way was, was Robert himself. And, you know, it was never a deal where we thought, you know, let's just go start our own pedal company. It was a deal where, you know, we didn't want to compete with them, but we needed we needed to ensure our livelihood. So, a lot of us left. Right. Um, right. Obviously, you know, if if you talk to Robert today, or know him, or or know the pedals that he's released since since 2011, it's easy to tell he's he's gotten. He's back on the right track, and and all of that's behind him. Right. Yeah, that was something that we we had talked about when he was on the show, and I said it was right around to me. You know, I said this is outside looking in, but what it looked like to me was around 2012, 2013, somewhere in there, there was a shift in what what they were doing over there at Keeley, and it almost makes me think. And and wonder if the fact that all you guys did leave was sort of a wake up call that it was like oh this is a legitimate problem and not just something I can can deal with. Yeah, you know, I, I it definitely had had an effect on him. Um, also, there were there were other more personal issues there that in in Robert could could jump into that. You know, just with with his now ex wife. Um, changes changes that happened there that that helped him drastically um but yeah i mean that was that was keely in a nutshell now i was i was there for basically 10 years so that's that is a very small nutshell there's <laughs> there's a lot there um but uh but no i i i left in in april of 2011 
uh, followed Isaac over to uh, a small place in the city that, that built industrial uh, remote controls for like locomotives and overhead cranes and things like that. Um, another, let's see, four other employees from Keeley also joined us over there. Uh, Eric O'Reilly, Dusty Nelson, um, Scott Murphy, who was who was one of our engineers up at Keeley, uh, James Neesmith, who is now over here at Mammoth with us doing the Keeley mods. Coincidentally, uh, all of us went to this this industrial remote uh, company, and I was there for about a year, and then got a call from from the owner of Foresight, uh, and he basically had a, a position opening up. It was in Norman, at, and by then I had already moved to Norman. Um, my wife was, was pregnant with our second, and honestly, being closer to home was, was a big deal for me. Uh, and then I took the job at Foresight. And... Then you started helping them optimize for pedals? Is that... Like, I know you already kind of kicked them in that direction. So, so st- exactly. So, w- when I started with with Foresight, the, the thing that Foresight was doing at the time was powder coating, uh, in addition to offering, you know, knobs and pots and and uh, switches and, and all of the components that, that your typical uh, boutique effects company would need. Um... Yeah, so so we were doing we were doing powder coating at the time in a in a very small room, basically right next to the oven. Uh, it was a dirty operation, I'm sure. At the time, we had uh, more issues with blems and and powder contamination than than we do now by far. Um, and and really, in terms of screen printing, we we weren't there yet. Uh, we did some hand screen printing for. A couple of local companies, but uh, but really that that process is long. Uh, we were using epoxy based inks, so you, we'd have to bake them afterwards, which would take up time with the powder coating. It was a, it was a nightmare. Um, all of the drilling we did, uh, we used fences on the drill presses to basically really? <laughs> hold an enclosure in place like close enough to where the holes were supposed to be it was it was rough um right right around i think it was around october of 2012 uh we moved out of the the incredibly small facility we were in at that time uh and then moved into uh a 20,000 square foot building on the other side of town and and obviously we're still there to this day uh we have filled it up with with a ton of equipment we still have some room to expand but we've we filled it up quickly um we got away from our old drilling habits i think at this point we're running uh one two uh five cnc machines uh like i had said uh earlier um uh, we do a lot of digital printing. We still have uh, the capability of doing manual screen printing, which, which is what we do with any of the metallic inks. So for like you know a silver or gold, we we will hand print those. Um, let's see. And then uh, in addition to all of that, we overhauled the the powder coating process altogether. Now we run. We, we run two separate booths, uh, three separate ovens, and, and just keep that cranking all day long. Each, each booth has its own separate filtering, so we don't have powder contamination issues anymore. Um, and, and our guys have a goal of, you know, a thousand enclosures a day, which is hard to believe, but this industry moves more than a thousand pedals a day. <laughs> well, so there's some companies that uh, that they don't do a thousand a day, but you know what they do basically on a monthly basis, and sometimes it's like, whoa, when you yeah. <laughs> when you actually see some of those numbers, it's like, 
well, no wonder there's 30 employees over there because exactly. that's a lot of work. Even it, if you're it, not it doing is. what you do. I mean, we've we've got, I think we're up to seven employees that that pull parts full time. And you wouldn't think it, it would take a lot of time or, or be very hard to, to pull parts. But uh, when you're getting, you know, around 100 parts orders a day and they can range from, you know, 20 items on one page to 200 items across nine pages, you know, it's it, it, it can get it can get tough at times. So. Right. I mean, it's just it. It is a small industry, like let's let's not like make it sound bigger than it is, but at the same time, some of the things that are involved just i mean even if a company is moving something like a hundred pedals a month it it takes a lot of moving parts to be able to put out a hundred pedals a month really yeah and and also I mean you know a lot of these companies that that do a uh, hundred a hundred pedals a month it most of the time it's not just one pedal they'll have two or four or you know maybe even eight different models that they sell and that's that's the one thing that that honestly we've we've tried to to cater to here at mammoth is you know just just being able to offer you know a, a quick turn solution for for 10 pieces or, or more of of each unit so right right i mean it's kind of surprising cuz the fact that you guys will do you know for one client you might do a thousand enclosures um and then to turn around and be also be able to service somebody who only needs 10 um that seems like a unique position not just in this market but in manufacturing in general i don't know that that there's just a ton of i I'm, I'm not super familiar familiar with like factory work and things like that but it seems like usually the you have to go to two different companies to get that kind of range right yeah i mean it definitely requires uh you know balancing what what we have on our production forecasts each day um we can't we can't take we can't take a 200 piece order and stick it in front of a 10 piece order if the 10 piece order is a day older it's just it's just not how it works so we have to schedule our manpower manpower in a way that that ensures that the small the smaller jobs get finished uh in the same amount of time as as a larger job now i'm not going to lie there's there's times where where we'll get uh an insanely complex 500 piece order or you know even a 1000 piece order well those we obviously work with our customers to make sure like okay we'll get you 200 now when when would you need the next 200 because there's just it's it's not phys, it's not physically possible for us to run just one uh thousand piece order and then make everyone wait obviously uh these our our customers need to be able to build their pedals they have they have employees that they have to support or or dealers that they have to get pedals to and then those dealers have their own employees to support so i mean at no at no point can can we afford to to make any of our customers wait we have to we have to keep it balanced right 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 that makes a lot of sense and it's it's also uh probably a bit stressful at times because uh, let's say you know they, the customer ordered a whole bunch of stomp switches, and the order fell through somehow. Didn't or they were bad or something. Well, you can kind of turn around and order stomp switches. Yes. Somewhere, you know. <laughs> but your enclosure—that's like the one part in this. I mean, other you know, barring any like new old stock crazy, you know, mojo parts, the enclosure is like the one part that you really can't do without, and it, <laughs> you have to get it. And it has to be right, and it's super important that it's right. So that I imagine that gets a little grating at times. Just thinking about the pressure of that, it, it does. But but honestly, um, I'm I'm 33. I'm I'm one of the oldest uh, guys in 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 this shop, and 
uh, you know, all, all of my employees, aside from maybe three, are, are younger than I am, and and they they are all super dedicated to to what we do here. And if 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 we do run into a problem, or you know, if we did, you know, print an order and the print was off, or, or drill an order and and our drill file was off, or we didn't probe an enclosure correctly. Uh, as soon as as soon as those guys hear that that we have ran into an issue, uh, th- they'll they'll own up to to the problem, and they'll put in they'll put in the time to make sure that we get it right. Um, it's it's a you know it's it's something that that honestly comes from from my Keeley days where the customer was just number one. Uh, our, our motto then was engineering the finest in customer service. And that's, that's just how I was brought up in this industry. So we, you know, we, we try to do the same thing here. If there's ever an issue, we have to turn around, fix it and make it right for our customers as, as soon as humanly possible. And with, without the team that I have today, it just, it wouldn't be possible. Right, that would have been a little bit challenging to do in the uh, the dirty uh, drill press environment that you were in before. Oh. <laughs> it it just it wouldn't have happened. Uh, we we did have we did have an outside CNC shop that we would use for for things that were just way over our head back then. But but even then, being here in Oklahoma, uh, the oil field industry is king. So anytime our outside CNC shop had had a job to do for for an oil field company, our stuff would just get thrown to the side. Right, and then they're also, I mean, so I know things have to be precise in the oil industry, but they're probably not quite as concerned with the focus on like looks. <laughs> I would imagine. No. So no. I mean, things have to they have to fit and they have to work, but they may not have to be gorgeous when they do it. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if they've got a, you know, a small speck in a, in a, you know, something that's been powder coated for, for that industry, they don't really care so much. But when this, when it's a guitar effect pedal, you know, most, most companies hold, hold all parts of their production to a super high standard, not only just the parts, but the enclosures themselves. And, you know, that's, that's something that that we can't get away with here like if there's if there's a the smallest flaw in powder coating and and our customer isn't isn't okay with it then it's on us to fix it i mean they they paid for you know 10 good units or 100 good units it's it's our job to get them 100 good units right i mean and that's kind of what the whole you know where the whole boutique you know, quote unquote industry came from was that attention to detail in sound and in the whole package. And also knowing that if there was a problem and you called up the shop, the owner was probably the guy that was going to talk you through it. And that's why the industry has become successful in what it is today, in my opinion, is because people have come to expect that. And that's why there's so many companies. And obviously it started with guys like Keeley, you know, and, and, I think that's the appeal of the industry, like because anybody can go buy a boss pedal. Um, yeah. It, but knowing that it, you can very likely, like, you know, like you say, have the best in customer service, that's part of what you're paying for. Um, anyway, I think that was just a really gen- general observation that I made that everyone already knows. So groundbreaking journalism here, <laughs> but. <laughs> um, there was a question that I, uh, so we're getting kind of close to the end, but we still got some time. What is a... I've talked way too much. <laughs> this is a podcast. You're supposed to talk. If you just sat there and didn't, it would be super awkward and I wouldn't know what to do. I've rambled. <laughs> you have, oh, trust me, you have not rambled. Uh, there's a little left, well, There's a little good. podcast you may or may not know about that I'm a part of uh, called Chasing Tone. If you want to hear some rambling. Yep. That's where you go. <laughs> we do that finer than anyone else in the industry. Oh, it's not that bad. <laughs> you, you guys, you guys do do a good job of staying on point there. Oh well, that's that's your opinion, I guess. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> some other people have left other reviews. Um, 
No, the question I wanted to ask, um, and this is actually for myself too, is there a piece of what Mammoth does or what you do that may not be obvious but is a big part of your job that it might be kind of like a lesser thought of part of of the puzzle? You know, one one of the one of the things that that Mammoth does and 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 does exceedingly well and and really is you know something that that the the general public or the end user doesn't think about is you know we our our customers obviously develop new products and a lot of times they're they're trying to hit you know the NAM deadline or you know Black Friday deadlines things like that and the the one thing that that we've always tried to do here is just you know, if it's if it's a new product, like make sure that we nail it on every aspect from the powder to the, the machining to the print and that we get it to get it to our customers in time. So not only can they build it, but they then have to do the marketing, um, all of the, the social media posts, everything that goes into that, shoot their videos and then have it. A, available to sell to dealers so that then dealers can turn around and you know sell it in time for black friday or for christmas or or what have you um and you know i i like to think that you know my my powder coating guys here or or my my graphics printers like they're they're all a large part of that and it's it's a part of the industry that that no one ever really thinks about, and unless unless you're doing that yourself, and, and unless you're you're cutting your own enclosures or, or doing your own powder coat. But like, in in a in a weird way, like the 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 guys here in the shop, the the guys and girls in the shop, are partially responsible for you know, making sure that that product does make it out to end users in, in, in time. Um, and, and it, the, the other piece to that is like, just, I don't know. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is the, the really cool piece to that is we get to see a lot of the new gear, you know, a month or sometimes even two months, or I, I think there was, there was an instance this year where, uh, something that we had worked on like 10 months uh, prior to it even being released. And with the, the majority of the shop all being musicians, it kills us to, to see <laughs> to see products so far in advance and then have to wait for it to get released. Right. Like, man, I want that. I want that so bad. But it's just a metal enclosure right now. <laughs> it's Yeah. No, that's that's exactly it. But. The the other piece is just you know we have we have the greatest customers there's there's just no no way around it and you know a lot of times you know I might have a, a small critique for them on on the powder choice or the the graphics color or the graphics themselves and or or Isaac might have a critique or Tim I mean you name it and uh, our customers will listen to us we'll listen to them. You know, we'll we'll tweak the graphics in a, in a way that that you know are more pleasing to to the end user. Or you know, if something doesn't line up with the drill file, if if something was wrong there, you know, we'll we'll do what it takes to get it adjusted and and you know get you know second versions of samples sent out to guys so that so that they stay on track. Right. I think it it might be a a, a almost a secondary service that you're kind of offering just by nature of seeing so many pedals and seeing good ones and I mean, and the not so good ones and kind of going, or even not, not even good and not so good, but even ones that are like, this one looks really good and it's selling really well. This one is a similar pedal and looks terrible and they're not moving very many of them. So let's try to help our customers avoid that. You know, that's kind of like a, almost a peripheral benefit of using you guys. Um, to do enclosures and all that stuff too. So that's really yep. cool. Exactly. So we we have hit on a lot of stuff. We've most, mostly focused on like your overarching role in the gear industry, 
But one thing really cool <laughs> that we haven't talked about, we t- did touch on Keeley plenty, but we haven't really mentioned the fact that Keeley mods are back. Keeley mods are back. Um, mm-hmm. 2015, he uh, he had discontinued the mods. Uh, obviously, for for uh, Guitar Pedal Company, it's hard to support your competition. And for Keeley, they were growing in a direction that that honestly, you know, kind of kind of approaches those those boundaries. Um, you know, when you when you design or when when he designed the the red dirt um it it's it has settings that that sound incredibly close to uh the tube screamer right and at that point like why do you why do you hurt the cells of your own product to sell someone else's product so they they made the they made the choice to to discontinue the the mods obviously uh a large a large part of the industry uh uses boss and ibanez pedals they're they're great sounding effects stock they they're they're made to sound even better after after certain modifications have been made um <clears throat> you know working for keely for all of those years and and doing all of those mods it was it was tough for me and isaac to to see to see them kind of go by the wayside um and and after after communicating with him for for a couple of months, you know, just trying to figure out what his plan was, was he ever going to re-release them? Uh, I think I just harassed him enough to the point where finally he caved and and decided to let us, you know, not basically reoffer reoffer the modifications, and and that's what we're doing now. Right. So you have a, uh, I mean, it's worth noting too that so you were the guy or one of the guys at Keeley, you and Isaac, uh, were doing those mods. And now essentially what you have is some of the original Keeley crew who was doing them in the first place doing them again yeah. under the mammoth, if, the, you know, mammoth umbrella. If if you own any any of the Keeley modified pedals, you know, pre-2011, if you pop the back plate off and see... Uh, terribly scribbled J A in there, well that was modified by me. Uh if you see an even worse I N in there, well that was that was <laughs> Isaac. Um uh another guy that works here, James James Neesmith. Um if you see a very neatly written J N inside your pedal, well that was modified by him. So um we've got you know, three guys that you know between all three of us, uh, there's about 27 years of experience there. So um, that's that's what we did. That's that's what we, you know, we we that's how we got into this industry. It was it was really with the mods. Now, Isaac Isaac did a lot more servicing. Eventually, I I did a lot more work on on just the the financial end with Keeley and, and the day-to-day management. And, uh, but James, James was really our guy back then who, who handled, who, who could handle literally every single mod that we did. Right. And he's the guy again. So that's kind of cool. He, he is the guy again. Yes. That, it all comes full circle. I love it. That's yeah. it. I was really excited when he told me those were coming. I was like, oh man, it felt like they'd been gone longer than a year. It really did. So that's yeah, a, no, it, it 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 did to us as well. Um, I don't know. I just I couldn't I couldn't stand to just sit there and 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 see nothing new come on that front. And that's that's something that we'll do here. I mean, obviously, uh, we we sell the the clickless kits. Well, as as part of the mods, we offer uh, the clickless relay add on to to the mods. Uh, Eventually, we'll we'll get into some 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 more complex modifications to pedals. Um, we'll do we'll do some tap tempo mods to to some of the delays, things like that. So it's you'll you'll see a lot of fun and exciting stuff coming on that front from us. That'll be fun. I'm super excited. Yeah. Now you got me even more excited. I was I was jazzed <laughs> before. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, See, I'll I'm a, I'm a parts nerd. Up. Like, if 
if we if we have new parts to release, honestly, that's that's kind of what gets me. So, <laughs> right. I don't know. If they, that's probably pretty rare. Everyone gets excited about new pedal releases, but the parts themselves, you even get jazzed. Ah, uh, for that. the I guarantee you, for the manufacturers, whenever you know, whenever that parts package arrives, whether it's a Mauser box or Jigiki box or a box from us, like there's there's something there that gets them excited. I guarantee you. Okay, I could see that. I could definitely. Yeah, that's why uh, Leon sends me pictures of boxes of jacks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, that would be Leon from Pelican Noiseworks, who lives in the same town as me, and we hang out all the time, one of my best buddies. So, anyway, well, we're right at that that hour mark, so I have to, before you hop off, I do have to ask you the classic and most important Tone Mob question, which would be, uh, Jacob, what what is your favorite kind of pizza? Oh, man, you know it's Totino's Pizza Rolls. Totino's Pizza Rolls? I'm kidding. Oh, <laughs> hey, they're not. Maybe, bad. maybe when I was a child. No, honestly, I'm weird when it comes to pizza. Uh, if the pizza crust could just be made entirely of like a portobello mushroom, oh, I think I would be in heaven. That would be amazing. That would um, be really good. I don't know. It's the more mushrooms you could put on a pizza, the happier I would be. But at the same time, there's there's got to be either some ham or Canadian bacon or, you know, there's got to be some, some meat there as well. So Of course. Um, you know, peppers, things like that, onions, that's for the birds. Uh, give, me a, give me a solid mushroom pizza and, and I'm happy. Solid mushroom pizza. You heard it here first. <laughs> you heard it here first. Uh, the head honcho over at Mammoth Electronics is on mushrooms. That's oh, that's all yeah. I got out of that. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's going to take that sound bite and do something terrible with it. Oh, I know. That was a <laughs> terrible setup. I walked myself right into it. Right on, man. Well, um, I'll just let you give everything a quick plug and uh, where your people can find all things Mammoth. Yeah, um... Our website, uh, mammothelectronics.com. You can you can obviously find all the parts you would need to, to build any pedal, really you can imagine. Um, uh, we also have all of the services on there for for machining, powder coating, and printing. So it's all it's all really easy to to find there. Uh, we offer kits so that you know if you if you don't want to design your own pedal to start with with if you want to build one from scratch, we've got the kits there. Um, you know, check us check us out on Instagram. We're trying to to plug you know our customers and, and and really if they're not our customers, just just guys in the industry as a whole. Um, you know, maybe maybe a little bit more important than our website is 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 our manufacturers. With without them, you know, doing as much business as they're doing, you know, we're we're nothing here. So most importantly go go buy pedals from from your local builders or or other boutique builders support them that's that's the biggest piece right on that is a that is very nicely said so uh thanks for coming on jacob i will go ahead and uh wrap this up then uh thank you very much awesome yeah you're welcome thank you sir mhm so for jacob this is blake and as always folks good luck and good tones Thank you very much for tuning in. I I always appreciate it. I know there's lots of shows you could be listening to, but right now you're listening to mine, and that is extremely flattering. Also, if you have a little bit of time, please go check out Mammoth Electronics. I feel like they're a little bit, little bit of an unsung hero in this industry on the consumer side. Um, all the people that build pedals know about them, but a lot of people who buy pedals do not, and they are a really important part in this industry, and we all love effects, so go check them out, show them some love. Maybe you discover your inner DIY pedal building nerd side that you didn't know existed. Who knows? If you have a little time and you've been enjoying the show, please uh, leave a review on iTunes. I know every show that you listen to, every podcast always is constantly asking for iTunes reviews, but there is a reason for it. It does help us a lot, so Thank you very much for tuning in. If you have time, please leave an iTunes review, and I will talk to you next time. Take care.
One last thing before we totally sign off here, I just want to remind you that if you do any shopping at Stringjoy, that's Stringjoy Guitar Strings made in Nashville, that will help me out as well. As I've said for years, I'm heavily involved in that company, and I really do think they're making the best products on the market. So if you would like to try custom strings, go to ToneMob.com slash Stringjoy and check them out today. I seriously, seriously, seriously love what the team down there is doing. I help them out with all kinds of things, and by you supporting them, you are also supporting me as well. And hey, you need some strings, so why not get some custom strings just for your guitar and playing style? Again, the link for that is ToneMob.com slash Stringjoy, and that will take you right to their website, and you can do all your shopping through there, and that will help everyone involved out. So thank you very much. Talk to you next time. We are brought to you by the wonderful folks at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Yes, Gun Street Wiring Shop. I've talked about them before. I used to say based out of Bend, Oregon, but guess what? Sean moved to my neck of the woods. Sean's in Portland. Sean is awesome and has helped me with a bunch of stuff lately. And if you have wiring needs for your guitar, he can help you too. If you want to get weird with it, he can get weird. If you just need to spruce things up a little bit, there's your guy. He takes all the guesswork out of doing your guitar wiring, and he makes it simple, and his customer service is top-notch, and I can't say enough good things about Gunstreet as a company. I really respect Sean and what he's all about, and the product is top-notch. I've got three different guitars that now have Gunstreet harnesses in them, and I could not be happier. So go to GunstreetWiringShop.com and check them out.